2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. If you take time to examine yourself and test whether you are in the faith, what would be your conclusion? There is a real God that you cannot lie to. You may lie to the world by acting godly on the outside, but your heart speaks the opposite. You may even lie to your family and friends, but there is an omniscient God that you cannot lie to. An omniscient God that looks at the very heart of an individual. An omniscient God that looks at the motive of each individual action. An omniscient God who cannot be mocked. The topic of, if you were arrested for being a Christian may seem like a weird topic, but it is one that must draw our attention to reflect and ask ourselves if there would be enough evidence to convict us for our Christianity, or would you be let go for insufficient evidence? In a court scenario, a suspect is often proven guilty when there is sufficient evidence that they committed a crime. If you are arrested today for being a Christian, will you be found innocent or guilty? Salvation is evident. Salvation is something that can be seen in an individual's life. Salvation is not something that you alone witness. The people around you will see an evident change in your life when you are born again. If you were arrested today for being a Christian, will you be found innocent or guilty? Will the people at your workplace and your friends say you are guilty? Or will they plead you are innocent and be surprised that you have even been arrested for being a Christian in the first place? How can you be guilty of being a Christian when you live a life of loving the world? James 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. How can you be guilty of being a Christian when you are as mean as a rattlesnake, unloving, harsh, judgmental, cruel, and mean? On the other hand, would you be found guilty? I pray that each and every one of you would be found 100% guilty for being a Christian. I pray that the fruits of the Spirit are evidence in your life. Galatians 5, 23 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Are you a loving individual, loving to your family and to the world around you? Love is a fruit of the Spirit and the people you start by loving is your immediate family and the people in your home, your kids, your husband and wife. How can you claim to be a Christian and your very own children are scared to approach you? How can you claim to be a loving Christian but everyone has to walk on eggshells when talking to you because you are a ticking time bomb and at any moment you are liable to explode? The first fruit of the Spirit is love. You cannot separate a Christian from love. And this is a word to fathers. You men have a tremendous responsibility to love your children. I have pastored a lot of people who struggle to understand the love of God because he is described as a father in the Bible, and their only comparison to the word father is their earthly fathers. And let's just say their earthly fathers were not the best examples. And they struggle to understand the love of a father and the love of God I thank God for my own father. My father is a wonderful father. He is a father that I could see that I am his literal heartbeat. My father loves me with all of his heart. And his love cannot even be compared to the love of God for me. That made me understand the fact that I cannot even conceive or understand the love of God for us. Fathers, I encourage you to love your children. Love on them. Let them know what the true love of a father is. Hug your child. We are all called to be witnesses for Christ, and this involves walking in His footsteps. What does this mean? This means that our actions must reflect the image of Christ. We must love the way Christ loved. We must serve others the way Christ served the world, and we must forgive in the same manner that Christ offered forgiveness. These are just but a few of the things that we are supposed to do as we witness for Christ. Being a witness for Jesus does not only involve preaching and teaching about salvation and repentance or doing some evangelical tasks. Rather, it involves living in a way that is honorable, acceptable, and pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. For some people, the only seed of the gospel they will ever come across is your life. In Matthew 5.16, the Bible says, 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Everything that we do must bring back glory to our Heavenly Father. Our salvation is the light that Jesus gifted to all of us through grace. It should shine to everyone, including those who do not know who Jesus is. However, the situation in the world today is so different from this. As I look around this world, I cannot help but feel that we, as Christians, are failing in our duty to be witnesses of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We do not walk the talk of Christianity. What if we were arrested for being a Christian? What if we were accused of being followers of Jesus Christ and put on trial for it? Would there be enough evidence to convict us? This may seem like an extreme hypothetical scenario, but the truth is that our faith is constantly under attack in many parts of the world. In the early church, different people were convicted and persecuted for being Christians. These people are known as Christian martyrs. A Christian martyr is a person considered to have died because of their testimony for Jesus or faith in Jesus. This means that before they were killed, they were found guilty of being followers for Jesus. Christians are being persecuted, arrested, and even killed for their faith. In some countries, simply owning a Bible or gathering for worship is considered a crime. We may not face such extreme circumstances here in our country, but the question we need to ask ourselves is whether we are living our lives in a way that can provide enough evidence of our faith. Are we truly following Jesus Christ and obeying His commandments? Do our actions and words reflect the love and grace of God? Would our friends, family, and co-workers be able to identify us as Christians based on our behavior and attitudes? Jesus himself said in Matthew 7:20, you will know them by their fruit. Are the fruits of our actions admirable and honorable? This is something that we must take seriously as followers of Christ. Sadly, it is to be feared that many modern Christians, if arrested for the crime of following Jesus and tried in a court, would have the charges dismissed for a lack of evidence. We may go to church on Sundays, but do we truly live out our faith throughout the rest of the week? We may say that we love our neighbor, but do our actions show it? We may claim to follow Jesus, but do we really seek to obey his commands? This is what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Calling yourself a Christian is not enough proof that you really are. Going to church every Sunday is not sufficient evidence that you are doing the will of God. This is why Jesus is saying that not everyone who calls him Lord is fit for eternal life in heaven. What matters most is our actions. If we have been walking in line with the principles of the Word of God, and if we have been obedient to Christ's teachings, we cannot afford to be complacent in our faith. Rather, we must strive to live our lives in a way that provides evidence of our love for God and our commitment to following Jesus Christ. We must let our light shine in the darkness so that others may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Suppose you are arrested today for being a Christian. What evidence can you personally present before the court? What have you done or what do you do that can make people testify that you are a Christian? How do you speak? Do your words reflect the love and kindness of our Lord? The Bible states that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 34. This means that whatever you fill your heart with will always be known by the words that you speak. If the word of God and his teachings are full in your heart, you will speak his grace and his teachings. The opposite of this is also true. Are your words full of grace and love? Let us keep in mind that being a Christian is not just a matter of words, but of actions. May we strive to live our lives in a way that provides evidence of our faith, so that if we were ever accused of being followers of Jesus Christ, there would be no doubt in anyone's mind that we are indeed his disciples. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Those who display a form of godliness are those who outwardly show religious behavior. They appear to be godly, but it is only a facade. Their religion lacks true power, as seen by their unchanged lives. They talk about God, but continue to live in sin, and they are content with this lifestyle. So, 
What is a simple definition of godliness? It is living in a way that reflects the character of God, obeying His commandments, and seeking to honor and please Him in all areas of life. An even more simple definition of godliness goes as following. Godliness is not sinning. Godliness is not sinning. How do we know Jesus was godly? Because he lived 33 years on this earth not sinning. Who was the godliest person in your church? Well, it is the person who sins the least in your church. Who is the least godly person in your church? It is the person who sins the most. Now, our Bible in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, tells us that there are a group of individuals who have a form of godliness. This group of people will be left behind during the rapture. And when they are left behind after the rapture, a percentage of them will be shocked that they are left behind because in their minds, they were Christians. And a percentage of them will not be shocked because they know that the way they have been living is against the Word of God. The truth is, you know that God is, and you know that this same God who is, is the same God who made you. You know that God is eternal. You do. You know that God is invisible and omnipresent. Therefore, you know that God is watching you. And you also know that on one day, God will judge you. The truth is, some of you have God's laws, you have the Bible, you know the Bible, but yet you do not do what the Bible says. That right there is what is spoken of in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We are moving towards the rapture, and those who have a form of godliness but deny its power will be left behind.